Hello, everybody. You're very welcome to our first webinar of 2023. Um, please note that there will be an opportunity to submit questions, and um, you can do this at any stage using the Q&A button. And if time allows at the end, we'll answer them. And without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to John Coyne, who's a research technician with us in Inland Fisheries Ireland. And he's working on the Climate Change Mitigation Research Programme. So I'll hand you over to John. Thank you, Lorraine. Good afternoon and welcome to the following webinar. Uh, my name is John Coyne and on behalf of my colleagues and the team, it's my pleasure to introduce the following presentation. Uh, as a research technician, my primary role is delivering, collecting and managing quality climate data for both my own project and for my IFI colleagues. And I hope to give you a view of that in the following presentation. So we're going to run you through the following topics. Um, climate change from an Irish perspective, its impacts on our aquatic ecosystems, and the effects on cold water fish species in Ireland. I'm then going to run you through the origins and the methodology behind catchment wide temperature recording. And then I'm going to introduce you to the projects, the Climate Change Mitigation Research Programme and the Office of Public Works Climate Resilience Project. Their design and structure, catchments within the projects, what data is collected, and then I'm going to focus in on a particular time frame, and that is the heat wave of July 2021. We're going to focus on a, a one project looking at a stream network model created from the River Boyne. We're also going to look at evidence of thermal and oxythermal resilience within catchments during this time frame. And then we're going to look at the impact of heat waves on angling. So climate change from an Irish perspective. Ireland's situated on the western periphery of Europe, which means we have typically mild summers and winters. However, when it comes to predicting and modelling for temperature, the presence of the Atlantic Ocean makes things more difficult. However, there's some great work done, in, most notably by Nolan and Flanagan, looking at scenarios from 20, for 2041. This is one of their su such scenarios, and it summarizes as such. It means it be, mean annual air temperatures will increase between 1 and 1.6 degrees. The likelihood of extreme heat waves will increase. We will have fewer frost and ice days, lower average summer rainfall, and a higher likelihood of extreme winter rainfall events. So the following slide displays winter rainfall trends from historical weather data from stations on the north and the south of the country. And we can see that the trend appears to show an increase in winter rainfall from data sets going back between 70 and 80 years. So what are the climate effects on our aquatic ecosystems? Intensive flooding. The increased solar radiation and, and, and as a result, low water levels, prolonged intensive droughts in summer, reduction in available groundwater, habitat loss, habitat change, water quality downgrades and productivity shifts. These shifts then give an advantage to maybe for competition from invasive species. And from my own perspective, the impacts of these conditions on sensor loss and insulation of loggers. So what are the climate infect, effects on our cold water fish species? Well, today we're going to focus on salmonids, Atlantic salmon, brown trout and char, and these are noted as vulnerable uh, uh, from climate effects. And I forward, I, on the right hand side, I leave a paper uh, produced last year by my good colleague, Dr. James Barry, uh, looking at the vulnerability of Ireland's fish species to climate change. The temperature thresholds that we're going to go through today are based both on our own projects and on IFI operation guidelines. That is, with operations such as electrofishing and so forth, we use these temperature thresholds to, uh, to look at uh, as a risk to, to salmonids. 
So a stressful temperature we're looking at is between 19 and 20 degrees. But extensive periods of mean daily temperature over 20 degrees can cause more significant impacts. These include the movement and avoidance of that temperature, also known as behavioral thermoregulation. And from that, we have constriction of habitat. This can also have a big impact on the fish life cycles. Our warming winters can have an impact on egg development and larval development. And the loss of habitat is also a problem for juveniles and returning adults during summer droughts. So where do we get our methods from? Well, a big acknowledgement has to go to Dr. Faye Jack Jackson and Ian Malcolm at Marine Scotland. And the paper on the right shows is, is, is well worth a read. It's, it just gives you a good guidelines of how we approach this methodology. So how is it constructed? Well, it's constructed under two, mainly two parts. The first part is pre-selection. So we select our variables at 500 meter intervals. These include elevation, percentage riparian cover, and slope. Now it's virtually impossible to conduct a site every 500 meters. So we have to reduce that. So then we select based on some following approaches. We try and encapsulate the characteristics of the catchment in a smaller, more achievable number of locations. The benefits of catchment wide temperature model uh, uh, approach is the relatively low cost of loggers, te particularly temperature loggers, means that we can have a high number of replicates. But using GIS and spatial statistics ensures that we, we are accurate and unbiased and we give a good representation of the project of the catchment. So our own projects are based on the following. The, the CCNRP was initiated in 2019, primarily looking at near natural catchments. And to look at the impact of climate change on our drained catchments that are also involving arterial drainage schemes, an OPW funded project was initiated in 2020. The combination of broads both brings us up to 12 catchments in total. Our data is mainly uh, recorded in high frequency, that is between 10 and 30 minute intervals. The vast majority is offline, but there is some online data available on our net lakes network through our data voice. The offline data requires an annual rotation and redeployment program. And that is the majority of my role as a research technician. And we currently have 380 loggers in the field at the moment. The following slide shows us where those sites are. The slide on the left is the color indicates shows which, which, which uh, catchments are, are covered by each project. And the slide on the right shows the lakes serve lakes that are within that. So there's four lakes within that form the lake network uh, uh, within both projects. So if you recall the methodology of developing representative sites, this is how it's done. So this is the Arif, this is the River Arif, or our, our National Salmonid Index catchment. So the sites, the very landscape variables are on, in the blue box. And the gray sites are our pre-selected sites. They're far more numerous. And we've basically broken that down into appropriate selection. And that is in the red. How does that look in regards to a catchment? Well, this is how it looks in the following. So not only are the sites distributed evenly, but they're also distributed uh, through using the landscape variables. So not only, it's not just a visual uh, spread, it's, 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 a, it's, more, it's, more, it's less biased than that. It's using those landscape variables to do to achieve it. So how do we collect our data? What do we use when we deploy our loggers? So the mainstay of the of the logger deployment on our river, our rivers is to ensure that main that the loggers are installed in main flow path at all time. And they're also shielded from ultraviolet rays. So basically what we want to do is we want to make sure that water is flowing through these loggers, these housings at all times. We achieve that by installing at low flow, also known as base flow. And where applicable, we can use 
uh, OPW or EPA loggers to give us a Q95 level on the water level data. So that, that tells us then that we can get out there onto the river and install or, re, or redeploy our loggers. What do we measure? We measure water temperature. And in, uh, also we, in, in less number of loggers, we also look at dissolved oxygen, water level, and light intensity. And we also use additional data from hydrometric stations from our EPA and OPW sources. That may involve water level and discharge. So on the lakes network, what do we look at? Well, as most of the collection is done on the lake, we need to have a platform available to collect this data. So our data boys and our in-house thermistor chains offer that platform to conduct high frequency online and offline recording of water temperature throughout the water column, dissolved oxygen, water clarity, chlorophyll, and conductivity. The plot on the right shows water temperature in its in, in between line format and water column format. So what scenarios are we looking at? Well, one of the things is we can look at is dissolved oxygen fluctuations and its consumption during stratification events. A stratification event is basically where the top level of water is subject to uh, uh, high air temperature, uh, to heat, and as a result of, of heat waves. So as a result of benign conditions, whether it be low wind, high air temperature. And as a result, the bottom of the lake gets locked in. And this is where we're investigating the rate of oxygen depletion during those events. And another, what we look, another thing that we look at is also the, what happens when these stratification events basically dissolve. And in autumn, winter, we get our high winds, low air temperatures, and the, this scenario uh, basically dissolves in the year. And then also what we look at is the impact of stratification events during those heat waves. Another part of the project is to look at, is to look at the collection of water, weather data. So from a regional perspective, regional data is accessed from IFI and met air and sources. Regional weather variation has a big impact on local river temperature and ultimately future national scale models. But that's, just, that's only one part of the collection process. We need to go a little bit more localized. So local scale weather data is fundamental for lake models. And we measure wind, wind speed and wind direction, solar radiation, air temperature and humidity. On the right hand side shows an anemometer, which is, is, is on Lac Barra in County Donegal. The following measurements play a very important role in regulating lake temperatures. And lake temperature itself is also a major impact on fish movement and behavior. So the following shows a, uh, the, uh, when I'm honing in on, on now on a particular event, and that is the uh, heat wave of 2021. So there was an official heat wave in Ireland in 2021, but that means over five days with a maximum air temperature of 25 degrees. The section in red shows the anomaly over the mean of a 80 year data set. And the, site, and, the, and the line in black is indicated of the year. You can see on the right hand side where the air temperature was over 31 degrees in that particular day. That is the Guibara in, uh, River in County Donegal. So we're now going to focus in on one of the projects, and that is the OPWCRP. And the objective of that project is to is the mechanistic understanding of future climate change impacts on river networks that are subject to historical and ongoing arterial drainage schemes. You can see the, the as the plots as the plots show the impacts of direct climate effects on fish habitat, the ecological consequences for fish, and ultimately the changes in fish ecology and, and how all these basically all these interactions uh, affect ultimately affect fish habitat and fish ecology. So the questions that we ask with this project are how sensitive are fish populations to climate change impacts in channelized river habitats? Does arterial drainage produce a compounding effect in combination with climate impacts? And what potential mitigation solutions can be implemented? 
So you may have recalled earlier the pre-selected sites to select sites. And this is particular to the River Boyne. So this is a stream network model from July 2021, revealing some very interesting results. There was over a 10 degree difference in the average daily water temperature between the coolest and warmest rivers. It revealed large differences in vulnerability of fish habitat to heat wave events. And the model also revealed white channels with low tree cover and rivers draining from lakes most prone to excessively warm temperatures. If you look to the map on the right hand side, if you notice where the lakes are, there is also, it does show higher temperatures and also at the mouth of the river where it is it's reached its highest point. This is a, a visual uh, 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 look at the map on the right hand side. The colour codes are indi indicated for that. You can see the blue site uh, is the coolest and we have a median site in purple and our hottest site at the mouth of the river in red. So within the CCRP, we also had some field observations and this is an example of such. This is the River Noor. And so we compared two sites in the River Noor with a similar gradient and elevation within the catchment. And it reveals thermal resilience during the heat wave. A critical water temperature of 19.1 is, is highlighted, uh, uh, you know, going from yellow to purple, just to give you an idea of where these temperatures are shown. Site A is situated on a regionally important aquifer and is an important site for both IFI and EPA Water Framework Directive monitoring. Site B is situated on bedrock with little groundwater activity. And to sum summarize this, this basically shows the power of productive groundwater influences on thermal regime. Landscape can also have a big impact as well as groundwater. This is an example from the Guibara River in County Donegal. The site is of similar gradient and elevation and also, is on, and also shares the same groundwater influences. That is very little. So you can see where, where uh, uh, the thermal resilience of our uh, site A. So basically site A is situated in an SAC, a special area of conservation and a blanket bog. Site B runs off an area of exposed and underlying bedrock. So while both are present in a peat dominated environment with very little groundwater effect, it shows the power of wetlands to absorb and to regulate water temperature. This is another example of oxythermal res resilience during the heat wave of 2021. So this is a pilot study we conducted looking at temperature and oxygen dynamics during the July heat wave. Despite water temperatures exceeding 25 degrees, dissolved oxygen remained high and never dropped below eight milligrams per liter. You can also see that nighttime temperature oxygen levels also remained elevated. This is indicative of good water quality and low nutrient inputs from the landscape. This displays how open exposed sites during heat waves could sustain fish populations for a period, but only if water quality conditions remain of a high status. So what about angling during these heat waves? Well, from the plot on the left, you can see that our Western spate rivers were subjected to some extremely high water temperatures during that heat wave of 2021. In fact, average daily temperatures were over 22 degrees for nine successive days on the Guibara, the Arif, and, Lu and the Koran system. Maximum temperatures were exceeding 26 degrees on the Guibara and the Arif. So as I mentioned earlier, Salmana start to feel generally terribly stressed around 20 degrees. And adult salmon and sea trout do congregate in deeper pools to avoid those peak temperatures. That makes them vulnerable to angling pressure. But the, 
what catch as even though the vast majority uh, and it's the best intentions of the vast majority of our angling community is to is to conduct catch and release in a in, in a best standard catch and release is simply not as effective when water temperatures get that high so we can use the data to assist fishery managers during these heat waves and also to just to to show anglers that sometimes when extreme when temperatures get too warm it's it's well worth just to take a break so when temperatures reach 18 degrees or 18, below 18 degrees it's 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 good to go and then once you start exceeding that you either take your time uh, make sure the fish is brought in very fast and recovery is 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 of the highest uh, importance uh, that means no photography and also using heavier tippets to get the fish in quicker and we do suggest that once temperatures do exceed uh, 19 degrees that it's 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 worth taking a break so what are our take home messages so we do know the catchment wide network the methodology allows the identification of thermally vulnerable stream networks and lakes but it also reveals positives so not only does it reveal the sites at risk but it also reveals positive thermal contributions from our first and third order streams and those habitats such as shaded reaches our wetlands and aquifers offer a very significant contribution to those catchments Identifying and protecting these habitats and their water quality is vital to maintain the existing refuges. So those river pools and subsurfaces of lakes that support fish populations, it's very important that the habitats of maybe our elevated systems and our upland streams, some streams that may not even have fish present, they could be very important in providing that positive thermal contribution to those situations. So what are our next steps? Catchment wide temperature models, they display the role of landscape and hydrological variables in identifying fish habitats at risk. It's hoped that our models will predict the future thermal sensitivity of those habitats to climate change. And physical lake models to discern available thermal and oxygen habitat for cold water lake fish during our summer heat waves. So from all of us here at the CCMRP and the OPWCRP, it's just not possible to conduct a network like this and collect all this data without the assistance of so many people. From landowners, fisheries managers, and other agencies, retired colleagues, and all our colleagues in IFI, we thank you all very much. Goramila Mwagif. Thanks, John. Um, there's just one question in, and it's just about making the information available to anglers. So, for example, that we're getting this monitoring data, how quick is that made available to anglers so that they can make a judgment call on whether to go fishing or how does that work? So basically, uh, as a lot of data that we have is, is offline, so sometimes the data comes into us a year a year later than already so at the moment we're just in the stage where it's almost like we're collecting the data collecting the data to provide to basically ultimately develop a model so what we hope to look at is what are the impacts of air temperature and these heat waves on our on our water temperature so it's hoped that ultimately what will happen is that by developing and building up some of this data that we will be able to give a real time uh, 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 information to anglers of when to go fishing and when not to go fishing. And then the other question, um, another question in is about you had a line drawn in the west and the east part of the country. On the east part of the country, they have severe droughts, I understand. So is there any um, information on that for angling, for example? So um, in regards to, yeah, so uh, we, we 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 are only building the data at the moment uh, with the, the the project the catchments that are within the remit of our projects. So, um, in regards to to looking at droughts, um, 
we 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 certainly will be looking at that. We we need to we're using we often use hydrometric data uh, from our own catchments, but again, it's only limited. It's only limited to the projects that are within our our the catchments that are within our projects, basically at the moment, unfortunately. Um, now, was including not just ourselves and our project, but there's other colleagues and other projects in IFI that are also looking at this. So it's it's ultimately we are going to get to that stage. We are going to get stage where we want to give real time uh, information to our angling community in regards to droughts, high temperatures, when to fish and when not to fish. Um, another question, can you give some insight into the work in the West Clare um, subcatchment and what the data there is showing to date? So the data, the data for the Dune, that's the Dune Bay, that's the big system is on, in, on the CCMR peak catchment, yes. Um, the data is available uh, on a uh, uh, from the 2021 uh, report. So the 2022 report is going to be out in uh, probably the middle of this year. So from from uh, recollection, it has the Dune Bay is is a really nice river, and uh, we didn't I can't see uh, we didn't have that much. Uh, extreme temperatures. There was a couple of sites where it did go up to maybe the mid twenties, but it certainly didn't experience the same temperatures as our more spate rivers, such as the Arif, the Guibara. Um, and this may be to do with the fact that the, the Dunebeg does have some uh, input from uh, uh, groundwater. So it does, it does have a little bit more resilience to high temperatures than say our typical spate rivers, such as the Arif and the Guibara. Okay. Um, another question, how difficult is it to restore degraded habitat from a practical perspective and from a regulatory perspective? Long question. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in terms of the regulatory aspect, there's people in my organization that are far more uh, uh, better than I am at that. I, I, as, a, as, a, as a technician, I guess my role is to look at the data coming in and to pass it on almost as a as, and it's there to identify the areas that are at risk. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, mitigation measures though, um, I certainly can have some insight on in that, in that there, is clear, there has been, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that uh, riparian cover does have a big impact on reducing that intensive temperature from solar, that's created by solar radiation. So while I don't have the, you know, in terms of the, the process in terms of getting this, the regulation, but in terms of actually applying a mitigation measure, yes, I certainly saw things like uh, riparian tree cover and stuff do, is, is a very beneficial thing to, to reducing those temperatures. Okay, another question. Um, in the still water environments, are there other water quality parameters being recorded, such as nitrate, phosphates, hydrogen sulfides, you know? At the moment, we, we, we don't, um, but we, we do, we do uh, look at uh, some, of the, some of the sites, there's still uh, water quality measures being taken, play, bit recorded by uh, the local county councils and uh, organisations like that. And also the EPA is also uh, involved in that. So from our own perspective, the, the, the lakes network has simply been set up from, a, from looking at uh, lake temperatures and, and actually a, a result and also dissolved oxygen and stuff like that as well. But um, we are looking at, one of the things we are looking at on Loch Sheelan, for example, is we're using that data boy platform to record chlorophyll levels. And chlorophyll levels are, chlorophyll A has a, obviously is a big uh, uh, part of uh, indicating the enrichment of, that, of a system. So we, we are looking, while we're not looking at those specific chemicals, uh, chemicals we're not, we're, we are looking at the impacts of those uh, levels, uh, chemical levels on, on the water. Um, another one, John, is it just temperature changes due to weather conditions that are being monitored or can thermal changes due to industry also be detected? Um, we haven't gone down to the specifics of the causes that at the moment it is primarily looking at uh, solar radiation and air temperature and um, we haven't been gone down to kind of looking at the root causes uh, as such as industry like that at the moment okay and another question just on the um 
the conservation attempts is that is this information and the output of the modeling informing conservation works that attempt to improve the resilience of certain river systems to drought events and have we any examples of that so far so at the moment um it, we, we we're still in a stage of of data collection um indeed even our models are a, a, a model is only as good as the data you get you, you supply you, you feed into it so basically at the moment we're still in that process of collecting data ultimately what we would like to, to do is to provide a model of not only our monitored sites but our unmonitored sites that means that by using those 12 catchments around the country we can actually start to look at surrounding catchments in that area and look at the impacts on that but purely at the moment in terms of of of, of generating a model that could tell us what areas uh, are at risk at the moment we're still in 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 the data collection phase and um, another question do we have any river systems that have become uninhabitable for salmon is due to climate change yet sorry did you get that question john I didn't, Lorraine, sorry. Yeah. Um, do we have any river systems that have become uninhabitable for salmon as yet due to climate change? Um, as of yet, due to climate change, no. What we have seen, as I described earlier, we have had situations where temperatures are getting close to the lethal limit of salmonids. But it's at the moment, our, our heat waves in Ireland particularly uh, are, are much less in terms of duration than I say our European colleagues. So we certainly are still lucky enough that the duration of the heat waves and the duration of those low water, high temperature events are still low enough that, that it, it, they're still short enough in duration that fish can survive and they can manage using those refuges that are still available. Okay, there's two questions I'm going to join together now here. Um, it's as a member of the public, is there any anything I can do to protect a river or stream passing through my property? And also there's another question in about, you know, locally led actions by community groups and local development associations. So, um, you know, how can we inform them? So, so for the first part, um, certainly I we, we really appreciate if, if when people take uh, the stewardship of their own property and looking at the, the rivers that flow on their on their own their own land that is the most important part of what we do all we, we we're only able to just uh show what data we're collecting but really we we, we rely on on landowners to, to to show that level of stewardship of their uh, areas so in terms of of looking at uh what they can do Sometimes the best thing is just simply leave it. I mean, we've, but also there's uh, some of my colleagues in IFI are so experienced in this in this area. One of the things they're looking at is things like buffer strips. So where you can put fencing in to just let, let simply let the let the land come back and let the area the, the riparian zone uh, grow back. Um, but in, and also in terms of local community groups. I know that my some of my IFI colleagues, um, I can recall some of the IFI colleagues on the Western uh, region uh, are involved in local angling clubs, uh, doing measures like planting trees, mitigation, uh, planting trees and, and things like that. So there really is some great work being done by, by my colleagues more than myself. Okay, um, I'm going to leave it at that because I'm conscious it's a lunch and learn series. So we have to have our lunch and allow people to have their lunch. And there are a lot of extra questions about what people can do to mitigate. So I think we've got a topic there to run another webinar and talk about how people can do more, um, which is great. And thanks for submitting the questions. Another quest few questions that came in were about recording it. Yes, it's all recorded and the plan will be to make it available on our YouTube channel. Um, another question was about making e-certificates available for participation. Um, maybe email me directly and we'll see what we can do about that. Um, if you think it's that valuable, yeah, absolutely. We're delighted that people are finding it so beneficial from an educational point of view. So without further ado, thank you, John, so much for kicking off our first webinar. And thanks, everybody, for joining and submitting the fantastic questions.